world is facing a health crisis on an unprecedented scale. Governments are desperately trying to contain the spread of the coronavirus. At the heart of the response is the idea that people with symptoms and those they live with have to self-isolate. Started to show some of the symptoms of the coronavirus. But cutting ourselves off when we feel ill and anxious can be difficult. It's a really worrying time. I'm just scared. I'm Dr. Zand Van Tulliken. I want to find out why self-isolation is so important in the fight against the virus. None of us has any weapons against it. I'm going to speak to the scientists leading the research. Now we're looking at these different kinds of interactions, different interventions, what might actually work at bringing this transmission down. Go to the heart of government to get answers about their strategy. And we have to have a balance between keeping people safely in their homes as well as shutting down. And find out how to isolate ourselves successfully. This is going to be anxiety on a national and international level. Well, we are in the midst of the most extraordinary unfolding crisis. I am looking at the news, announcing a set of measures that I would say a month ago were almost impossible to imagine. So we have all non-essential social contact banned. We have um, two weeks of self-isolation if you're symptomatic and 12 weeks for vulnerable people, especially older people. Over the next few months, self-isolation is going to be one of the most important skills to protect the people we love. So how do we do this? Well, I think there's a huge amount of confusion. There's a lot to find out. And the first thing I'm going to do is go and see a professor of intensive care. And he is an absolute expert in keeping the sickest people in the world alive. What I want to find out from him is how and why we should self-isolate. So look, I thought, um, really, you're kind of the first person I've turned to with this because I think we're in this very odd situation. It's not, uh, it's nothing. It's like nothing anyone from certainly our generation has faced. Absolutely, before. yeah. On an individual risk, most people don't have to worry. But let me give you some simple maths. I mean, you, you're a smart enough fella, right? So, w normal flu. If I get that, I'm going to infect on average about 1.3, 1.4 people. Okay, if there was such a division. Yeah. And if those 1.3, 1.4 people gave it to the next lot, that's the second time it gets passed on. By the time that's happened 10 times, I've been responsible for about 14, 1, 4 cases of flu. This coronavirus is very, very infectious, so every person passes it to three. Now, that doesn't sound like much of a difference, but if each of those three passes it to three, and that happens at 10 layers, I have been responsible for infecting 59,000 people. Now... I actually wasn't on top of that maths right. <laughs> when you were doing that. OK, that, that did come as a shock, yeah. Right. Now, most people are going to feel a bit pokey or not very pokey and be just fine, but they will have spread, a, spread it around. And a few will get sick at about day 10 of their illness. So they will need to come to a hospital. And when they're in a hospital, they will consume resources and time and people will look after them quite rightly and they will be monitored to see if they become really, really sick. Those people then come to an intensive care unit, and that's where, if you're critically ill, your life gets saved or not. And this is the issue. If we've got a limited resource, which we have, a limited number of ventilators, a limited number of doctors, a limited number of nurses, which is fine, because we can't run ourselves with a huge excess capacity all the time. If we overwhelm that, we can't provide that service of caring for these people properly. What kind of symptoms should we be looking for? How are we going to know if we've got this? The symptoms are, for most people, um, spread across a bunch of things. Not everyone gets all of them. Um, dry cough is common. That's really common. So a dry, hacking cough. But some people will also have a bit of a sore throat. Some people will also have a bit of a runny nose. But not all of them. This is not the classic pouring snot sore throat in most people. Upwards of a third will have a headache. You get that with viral infections, um, people with were achy, and high temperatures are not at all uncommon with this either. Um, and when I say high, properly elevated temperatures, and sometimes very high indeed. So I was talking to a friend on the phone the other day who's locked away in Cambridge with this, and he's got a temperature, he had a temperature of 40.6. That's getting pretty high. This isn't the end of the world, is it? 
No, we've got to remember that this is, I'm not, not going to play it down. It's going to be ugly. It's going to be horrible for a large number of people, but it will be a small number of people who get properly sick and a smaller percentage of those again that need to come to an intensive care unit. And we can save the lives of a large number of those people too. But please just remember that the best chance we can give for the people who do fall ill is if we've got enough beds and enough staff and enough kit to be able to be there for you. And if you are irresponsible enough to think that you don't mind if you get the flu, remember it's not about you, it's about everybody else. Hugh's so knowledgeable and he is taking this seriously and so we all should be. I feel a bit more serious now, but I also feel quite empowered. I understand why it's so important. And so the crucial thing now is we can all play a part in slowing this down. The key to that is self-isolation. So I need to figure out how to do it really well. I only really started showing symptoms properly this morning. So I guess we'd have another week from today. It's a pretty tough decision to make because obviously we've got a little boy. He's two years old. And so we had to, had to make that call about how we were going to how we were going to go about it. Well, there was obviously no preparation. We had no idea. I guess it either means self-isolating so you don't catch it or self-isolating so because you have it and you don't want other people to get it. We're just going to have to sit it out and just see what happens and see what the, how the advice changes. Mm. We've been asked to self-isolate and keep our distance from other people. Two metres is the recommended amount. Why? Well, one of the things that coronavirus does is it gives you a cough. So. I've set up an experiment. I've got ultraviolet lights, slow motion cameras and a fluorescent drink. I'm going to have a look into how the virus moves from one person to another. How far can a cough spread? Make my saliva fluorescent. <coughs> if I measure two metres from where I was standing, what you can see is that almost all the droplets have landed before two metres. Not all of them. You're not completely safe, but you're at much lower risk the further away you are from other people. These are real droplets containing real saliva, and they would all contain viral particles. So that's why we've got to wipe surfaces, we've got to wash our hands, and we've got to keep our distance from other people. Self-isolating can be a challenging experience, whether you have symptoms or not. I'm getting some tips on how to maintain a positive attitude from psychologist Kimberly Wilson. Hey, hey, how are you? Thank you for coming over. Normally I'd give you a hug or something, but... <laughs> this is a different time. No hugs. Apart from people who are severely ill, mm -hmm. for most of us self-isolating, the, the big issues are psychological, is that right? I think it's fair to say that this is an unprecedented event. and. More than ever, we're going to have general levels of anxiety rise. We're quite used to talking about anxiety in individual people or people who might be particularly vulnerable to it. But actually, this is going to be anxiety on a national and international level. Big things that people are going to be thinking about are managing anxiety, boredom and frustration. So how am I going to manage my boredom? It's not OK just to have a few books and think that your phone or a few movies is going to do it. You need to be much more creative. Puzzles, games, maybe crafts, maybe teach yourself to knit. Having lots of different options and different modalities just to give your brain a little bit of novelty. You're almost describing like a school timetable. <laughs> kind of. People probably should have some sort of routine. The thing about these sorts of days is that they will stretch and they'll kind of bleed into each other and you could end up just lying around not doing very much. And so actually it might be worth having a bit of a sense of, well, by the end of a week I want to have accomplished this. And that will give you something to focus on, a target to move towards. So we need routine. Yeah, and I think one of the things that people perhaps don't realise is that routine helps us to manage and contain our anxiety. What about the cabin fever, where you really start to get, like, almost itchy, you want to be outside so much? We all do have a need to move and kind of stretch ourselves and just feel like we have the freedom to get up, open our door and take a walk outside. And especially if you're going to be in with other people, that frustration will build. And so what I suggest is kind of having a bit of an escape room. So that can be just a little space in the house or in your room. You can just go and be by yourself. And the rule should be if someone's in the escape room, you leave them alone, give them some space. Even if you're in a one room flat with 
three or four people, having mm. some space that you can briefly call your own. Absolutely, because we I love all, that. as much as we're social animals, we all do have a need for quiet, for peace, for a little bit of a break from other humans. And so even if it's just a cushion in the corner of a room and you face the walls and you have your book, you can feel as if you have a tiny moment of peace and quiet. We're gonna have to be creative about the ways that we manage these unusual circumstances and these new difficulties that we're all gonna be facing. Okay, let me tell you my anxieties. Mm -hmm. I'm worried that I might die or might, I might be really ill and have a horrible moment of going, do I need to go to hospital or not? Mm. I'm much more worried that my parents will die, which even saying that out loud sounds, it sounds bad to say it. Yeah. No, and I think it's really worth saying that. And we shouldn't call it morbid because that's really the underlying anxiety that many people are going to have, right? That of illness or potentially death. And it's worth being able to say that out loud so that we don't feel like as, as if we're having to hide our true anxieties and feel like we're having to keep it all to ourselves. And the more that we can have these conversations, even in a very like, gentle way, then that's OK. And it's probably also, also worth saying that it's OK to have a bit of kind of dark humour about it. You know, humour is one of the ways that humans manage very, very difficult circumstances. What happens when you feel anxious is that your thinking shuts down and the part of you that can think more rationally about the future kind of gets a little bit disrupted. And all you can think about perhaps is the worst and the catastrophe and the worry and the feeling is that this will last forever. So it's always worth finding ways to remind yourself that it won't last forever. It will end, it will be difficult, but we will come through the other end of it. Self-isolation can be confusing and intimidating. For a start, there are two kinds of self-isolation. The kind where you don't want to pass the virus on and the kind where you don't want to catch it. So let me talk you through the rules of self-isolation. Rule one, you must self-isolate if you have symptoms. A fever over 37.8 degrees Celsius or a new cough. If you have either of those, you must stay indoors. Rule number two, if you have to self-isolate because you have symptoms and you live alone, then you need to self-isolate for seven days. But if there are other people in your household, then everyone has to self-isolate for two weeks, 14 days. Rule number three, if you're self-isolating because you or someone in your household has symptoms, you don't want to pass the virus on, so you have to stay at home. If you absolutely have to leave the house for essentials, keep your journey short and close to home. Rule four, if you have an underlying health condition or you're over 70, you need to self-isolate to protect yourself for 12 weeks. Now that's a long time, so the rules are a bit more flexible. You can leave the house and go for a walk, but stay away from crowds, large gatherings, and so on. Minimize your contact with other people. Rule number five, and this is my rule, not the government's. Do your best, but don't feel guilty. No matter how perfectly any of us follow these rules, the virus will still spread. We can't stop it, but we can slow it down. Those are the rules of self-isolation. Not everyone has to do that, but every single person in the UK should be practicing social distancing. Work at home if you can, minimize your contact with other people and avoid crowds. It's been quite difficult um, having our little boy, he's only two years old. Just keep trying to keep the kids calm and enjoying themselves. Already they're telling each other, oh, you've sneezed, you've got coronavirus, don't come near me, don't sleep with me, you know, stay away from me, don't hug me. I don't want to get ill, and I heard the coronavirus was just like a flu. Boring. <laughs> <laughs> what coronavirus will be etched, etched into their brain for life. I want to understand more about the virus itself. So I'm meeting virologist Elisabetta Grappelli from St George's Hospital. She's asked to meet at my house rather than a public place to minimise the risk of transmission. Medical training, we kind of focus on diseases that we know about and you have to learn about the disease, but, but nobody really fully understands this virus yet. Can you give me a sense of, I don't know, almost the virus's personality? Like, what's it, how is it moving? What can we compare it to? You know, all viruses certainly have one personality trait, which is they're clever. 
And uh, this particular one is clever in the sense that it's able to transmit via uh, droplets as we cough. And that's a pretty efficient way of going from one person to another because viruses are parasites. So they need to go into a human host, replicate, which means making more of, the, of themselves, and then go on to infect someone else. And if you think that this droplet, the cough, uh, that is a symptom, is how the virus spreads, you can also think how clever it is, because it's a very efficient way. But it's also new. A novel. It's a virus that comes from a different environment, uh, probably has been circulating in some kind of animal reservoir, and uh, it started liking us. Uh, and so and that's, uh, that's a danger. You know, it's nice to be liked, but certainly not uh, by a virus that we have never seen. And uh, it becomes more uh, uh, dangerous for us because he, as, a, as a society, as a population, if we've never seen a virus, none of us has any weapons against it. You've got this virus that's very clever, very sneaky and very new, so we don't really understand the enemy. Mm -hmm. How do we stop it moving from person to person? So we do have already key pieces of information. The coughing is the, the way the virus uses to travel. So that's uh, the fundamentals of uh, physical distancing, like we're doing now. We are keeping a meter, possibly a little bit more. Therefore, the virus, if I happen to be infected, the virus will actually land uh, before it actually comes into your personal space. The other aspect is actually the, la the, the, the virus can land onto surfaces and we might touch those surfaces. So as human beings, we do a lot of things with our hands, including touching our mouth, our nose, or glasses, like in my case. And all of these actions basically scoop up the virus and they bring it to where it wants to be. So this is the fundamentals of keeping a distance and wash your hands and clean the surfaces. I feel like I'm hearing at the moment a lot of people, maybe particularly outside of London, going, OK, look, we have flu, we have other viruses, what's the big deal? This seems to mostly affect the elderly, so it's not going to affect people of working age. Why all the fuss? Why are we shutting everything down? What's the big deal? Because actually, this is much more than just a flu infection. And uh, the, the evidence is that uh, 80% of the infected people will only develop mild symptoms. But this also means that 20 uh, will likely will actually need uh, hospitalisation. So we need to go to the hospital and properly being taken care of. And a portion of, uh, of, the, of these patients will actually require intensive care. So this is... Uh, 20 percent this is uh, this is one in five it's it's a lot uh, flu does not have this kind of severity of symptoms in this large proportion and there is also something else to be said we do have vaccines for flu we do not have this with this coronavirus so we are particularly vulnerable why is self-isolation so important this is a pandemic, and a pandemic uh, is a word that we use not just to describe the fact that the virus is everywhere on this planet, but also that uh, actually affects uh, everybody, every single one of us on this planet in all the aspects of our life. My symptoms started with a sore throat. Started to get a cough this morning. After about a day, I would say, uh, translated to uh, a cough. I am setting up an inflatable mattress in our bedroom. Um, you're meant to be two metres away from everyone, at least. And then I've also just had flu-like symptoms in the sense that I've, sometimes I've got really cold, sometimes I've got really hot. And so this all just feels a little bit strange. Just feel not nice, man. The rules of how and when to self-isolate are complicated, and so it's easy to get caught up in them and forget that a lot of us are going to be at home feeling poorly. and We're going to need to manage that as well. So, if we look in the medicine cabinet, we've got a few things. The most common symptom of coronavirus is fever. We've got two ways of treating fever. We've got paracetamol and ibuprofen. Almost everyone's got a pack of those in their house. Paracetamol works really well. There has been some controversy about ibuprofen. Some people are saying it can make the symptoms worse and make the disease last longer or make it more severe. So I would say start with the paracetamol and see how you get on. The other really severe symptom of coronavirus that people talk about is the cough, and that can be very, very difficult for people. Now, if you go to the chemist, you will find lots and lots 
of cough remedies. Most of them don't work brilliantly. You may have a very severe cough and these are not going to do very much good, but they might make you feel a little bit better. Final thing lots of people are getting really into is vitamins. These are my vitamins in my medicine cabinet. I take them sometimes when I'm feeling poorly, despite the fact that I know they don't really work. So it's a judgment-free zone. If you want to take vitamins, go ahead, but they're a bit of a waste of money. So in fact, most of the ways of managing illness at home do not lie in the medicine cabinet. There are some old home remedies that work pretty well. Make yourself a lemon and honey drink that may help a bit with the cough. It'll keep you hydrated and it tastes nice. Stay hydrated. Everyone should be drinking so that you're peeing regularly. You don't have to go overboard, but you do lose a bit more fluid if you have a fever. The other thing is if you've got a fever, simple things like a damp towel pressed to your forehead, the back of your neck or your wrists can really make things feel a lot better. In terms of nutrition, lots of people talk about special foods you should eat when you're ill. To be honest, eat what you like. Your body will guide you. If you're not hungry, relax about it. You'll be fine for a couple of days. If you're hungry for specific foods, go ahead and treat yourself. There are two things that are really important and the first is rest. It sounds obvious, but I think as a nation we have a tendency to try and soldier on. Well, don't do that. Relax, stay in bed, take it easy. But the other important thing is mobilize. You have to keep moving a little bit because you don't want blood clots in your legs and you don't want your lungs to shut down. So a few times a day, get out of bed, take a little walk around, shake your legs out and open your lungs, fill them up, try and open those air spaces and that will help keep them healthy. I hope those things will help most of us get through it, but a few of us are going to get severely ill. If you're very short of breath or you're feeling really bad, you do need to seek help. You can't help but worry about the over 70s, you know, and, and everybody who's in that, that um, risk category. My mum's diabetic and in quite poor health in general. Um, my sister's asthmatic as well. I've got a, an elderly mother who's 87 who's got a lot of underlying health conditions and she's currently got a, a bad cough and a cold. Family sticking together and, and just, just reaching out generally. That will all come through. It's not just people with symptoms who have been asked to self-isolate. People over 70 and those who are vulnerable have also been advised to minimise social contact. I'm going to meet Peter Snow and his wife Anne, who have already been self-isolating for a week at the insistence of their son Dan. Dan, are you here? Yes. How are you doing? Very, Let's very go, nice to see you. Right? Come on Good. In. Yeah, what come on strange in. circumstances to see you in. No, man. It's strange times. Come so, on. So. Mum and Dad are in the house. Mum and Dad are in the house. And I... you're not going in the house, is that right? I am not going in the house, no. OK. Um, it's lucky it's a nice day, so we can hang out a little bit in the, in the garden or I can talk to them through the doors. Uh, and uh, I asked them to go in about a week ago, yeah. My parents have two sons who are doctors and we, we've been slow. We sort of went, I think, life is normal until you hear otherwise. You've been much, much more proactive. So what? tell me about the thinking with that. My dad's got bad lungs. Uh, he's in his 80s. He's just absolutely, you know, straight in the crosshairs. You know, why not isolate if I can keep him alive till hopefully some drugs change, situation changes, we can flatten the curve, the ventilators will be available in the hospitals, whatever it might be. I thought, why not? It, it's the least I can do. When I came round a week ago, my dad was clearly, I could tell, I looking at him, he was nervous, he was, should he be meeting up with his neighbor? And I said, right, let's just, let's make this really simple. Let's just, let's go into lockdown. Hey, Mum and Dad, how are you? Hello, Danny Boy. Good. <laughs> That's about two metres. It's very nice to see you. I'm sorry. I feel like under other circumstances, I'd, I'd give you a hug or a handshake at least. You look all right to me. This is They're good. all fine. <laughs> How long has it been? Well, we rather enjoy life, so we, we, so we jumped the gun. Uh, and we've started self-isolating about a week ahead of time. So uh, here we are. We're enjoying it, aren't we? Yeah. Yeah, how's it going, Mum? It's good. It's good. <laughs> Surprisingly. Mixed, mixed reviews. No, no, it's very good. I mean, what, my big thing is we're being very positive, at least I am. And I'm saying, this is it. Me too. We're, we're awake today, we're alive, <laughs> it's spring, there are flowers coming out in the garden, we can come and do gardening in a minute. Uh, we're doing, we're reading a lot, we're uh, chatting a lot. Dan and his children do FaceTime with us, so that's really important. It's you, true you're, you're being positive, but you are eight years younger than I am. Yeah. So I'm being very positive, but I do bear in mind that I'm more likely for the high jump than she is. I guess one of the things we're, we're all saying about this virus is that it probably isn't going to go away. It will keep circulating. Eventually you're going to go out into the world yes. and it will still be there. A week ago I was tossing a coin and got very across the bit thinking, I mean, quite honestly, let's just catch this damn thing. 
let's go out and sort of say, oh, come on, virus, come and get me. Because um, there's obviously a very great temptation to have it and then to be one of the recovered people and hopefully immune after that. I don't know about the immunity, but there we are. Um, but then the trouble is that, I, that my doctor uh, that same day said, look, old chap, um, don't get infected. It's not really worth your while. If I caught it and then gave it to Peter, I would never forgive myself. I still wake up in the morning thinking, hang on, four months ahead, it's going to be dodgy. A lot of people will be immune because they'll have had it. We won't have. We're just not crossing that bridge till we get to it. You're right to approach it with this kind of spirit, I think. You don't need my endorsement, but it does, it does seem right. <laughs> Whatever. We haven't got a goodbye so well. Thank I guess a wave. We've always got a wave. We don't have to bye -bye. reinvent the wave. A virtual hug. Yeah, exactly. I'll see you later on, guys. Bye -bye. Take care. Bye -bye. <laughs> How worried are you feeling? I'm very worried. Really? Yeah. I mean, I'm not a doctor, so I'm, an, I'm, just, I'm just reading crazy Facebook posts all day, you know, but I'm, I'm worried. I'm, I'm, I'm worried about my mum and dad. I'm worried about my family. And then I'm worried about the community. I'm worried about the, the country. And uh, the strange thing is me standing in this garden where I grew up, I played on this lawn, and now I'm here putting my parents into isolation. You know, my dad, when I came to this house, my dad kept saying thanks, you know, and I brought some pasta around and just... And I thought, what are you saying thank you to me for, you know? It's difficult, you know, isn't it? You think you, a lot about... He kept me alive for 18 years. So I'm going to get him through the next six months. It's my job. With millions of us facing a period of self-isolation, many of us are worried about food. Nutritional psychologist Kimberly Wilson is on her way to a local shop to see what's still available. I think with the prospect of self-isolation, people are really thinking about making sure that they have enough food in for seven or perhaps 14 days of being inside the house. And what's going to be really important is making sure not only that there's enough food, but making sure that there's nutritious food in the house because the last thing we want is people to become unwell or malnourished while they're self-isolating. But we need to stay calm, focus on what we do need, and remember that other people will need food as well and that we also have a bit of a responsibility to our community to ensure that there's enough on the shelves for everyone else. Let's see what we've got. All right, so I'll grab some tomato puree. In a pinch, this can be used as a base to your tomato sauce. You can just dilute down a tablespoon or two. So looking for versatile ingredients that you can use in lots of different ways is going to be really important. The canned fish is a great option, uh, really rich in omega-3s, which is really important for your brain health, um, but also, again, really versatile. You can have it as a snack, add it to sauces, blend it up into a pate, all sorts of things. A curry paste. Who doesn't love a curry? Stock cubes. Cheese. A, lasts a long time if it's sealed, but can also be frozen. Maybe some peanut butter. Not just for toast, but actually it can make the base of sauces too. Onions, I think, are an absolute essential. They are a staple. They will last forever and ever and ever in a cool, dry place. Hello. Hi there. Is hey. there any flour? Or are you all sold Unfortunately, out? Unfortunately, we don't have that. Yeah, they're all gone. Really? Uh, we expect them to deliver today, but we didn't see that. Gosh. Yeah. People are, you know, panicking. They buy whatever they see on the shelf. We're just pulling things but off most, the shelves? Mostly uh, the flowers, rice, pastas. And this kind of thing, they did buy a lot, actually. A hundred people been waiting on the queue, so... You've had queues? We had a big queue, uh, last three, four, four, five days, yeah. Good. So, actually, this is the quiet, the quiet day now? This is the quiet day, quietest day since the beginning, yeah. I'm not worrying, we'll be all right. All right. Thank you. I'm off. Take care, stay you well. well. Thank you. Bye. Have a lovely day. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. I have managed to get the basics that I wanted, so some beans and pulses, some rice, some canned fish, some canned tomatoes, some spices, and that really should be good for the store cupboard to get me through, and I can stock up with little bits on the way if I need to. So one of the difficult things for people who are self-isolating all the people around them, is that you get paranoid that you've got this source of infection in your house and you can get obsessed with cleaning. Well, it is good to keep things clean, but remember, 
you're not trying to cover your house in toxic chemicals and kill the virus completely. We can't stop the virus. We're trying to slow it down. So you can do it pretty simply. For most of the house, people should be doing things like touching light switches with their elbows, if they need to touch them at all. You know, toasters, kettles. Do you need to touch them if you're self-isolating? Someone else can make you a cup of tea. But in a shared space like this bathroom, you know, most people are going to have to share a bathroom. You might spend a lot of time in here. And if you're symptomatic, you're going to be coughing on everything. How do you keep it clean? Well, actually, it's not very different to normal cleaning, OK? The most important thing is mechanical removal, by which I mean just wiping surfaces. So I've got normal all-purpose cleaner. It doesn't have to kill a thousand percent of all known germs, OK? And the main thing is a wet cloth, a bit of a spray, and give it a wipe, OK? And surfaces that you might have touched or coughed on, you just want to get those droplets off, get a bit of cleaner on them, wash the cloth, hang it out to dry, and that's all you're trying to do. We don't have to feel guilty about this, and we don't have to feel paranoid about it. It's been a bit of a whirlwind in terms of new news coming out every day. It's definitely been quite mentally challenging. I do feel that worry of what if I got it. I'm scared. I'm not. How about you, Tommy? Um, I don't know. I don't know. I'm not sure. I want to find out more about the scientific research which is helping shape the government's response to the pandemic. I'm meeting Adam Kucharski one of the experts at the forefront of the fight against the virus. This is about yeah, as close yeah. as we're getting, is that? There yeah, yeah. Like an, an air elbow bump. Well, look, come and... Uh, I'm, I'm very excited to talk to you, actually. I think this, this bench is sort of wide enough. We're yeah, outdoors. I think this we're is, okay, yeah. aren't we? Yeah. Um, so, look, what, tell me a bit. You, you are epidemiologist, modeler of epidemics. You work at the London School of Tropical Medicine, you're, which is one of the places that's sending information and advice to the government. You've written books about how epidemics spread. What does your life look like at the moment? At the moment, we're doing a lot of work to try and understand as much as we can about how this thing uh, transmits and what we can do to control it. Um, early on, sort of a couple of months ago, we were trying to look at where's the spread, kind of what's important as, you know, in China, these lockdowns came in, what effect is that having, how much is that reducing transmission? And now we're looking a lot more at, you know, these different kinds of interactions, different interventions, what might actually work at bringing this transmission down. But you're not just pulling things out of the air, are you? You're actually building computer models, simulations almost of the virus. Is that right? Yeah, we're doing a whole mix of stuff. So it's not just you've got one model here. You know, we've looked at, you know, for, for example, these lockdowns, you know, what's the reduction on average? How many people are spreading it at the start and at the end? We've looked at um, things like close gatherings, you know, how much transmission? If, if 10 people uh, attend a meal, what's the risk to, to people who go to that? So it's really all these bits of evidence and then trying to bring them together to, to try and work out what the most effective ways of controlling this are. And we'll say, you know, if you close schools for two months, this is what this will probably look like. If you get um, the elderly and risk groups to, to isolate for, for 12 weeks, that this is what the, the outbreak will look like. And then it really feeds up the chain into government and then they have to make those decisions of what combination of measures do we think is appropriate. At the moment, we seem to be doing different things to other countries. We haven't locked down the way China did early on. Uh, we haven't closed borders like Germany. Are we doing the right thing? Countries at the moment that are saying that they're going to close things down for a couple of weeks, that's not what's going to happen. Because once these interventions go in, it's going to be very tough to lift them without the risk of another outbreak. So I think really that's the balance that, that the UK and other countries will have to strike of we need to reduce transmission, but equally, you know, people need some kind of ability to live their lives in the meantime. Is the point of self-isolation to reverse this? Can we stop the epidemic? I think the real point of self-isolation is it can have a, a, an enormous effect on reduction in transmission. It won't control it by itself, but that action, if you think of it, is, is a disruption of a couple of weeks of your life but that could potentially reduce transmission by 20, 30 per cent. My minimal experience of working in epidemics is the one thing about them is that they do end. There is light at the end of the tunnel. Am I right about that? Have you got any optimism about this? We've got a really, really difficult situation we find ourselves in because usually, uh, you know, an epidemic that's mild, eventually people might build herd immunity if this spreads long enough. That's how epidemics end if enough people end up infected. But to get to that position, so many people would be ill and so, it would take so long and there'd be so much burden on the NHS, it's unlikely we'll see that anytime soon. So I think we really, until we get a vaccine or better treatment or much more effective testing, we're stuck in this situation where we're going to have to make really dramatic changes to our lives. Anyone suggesting that there's something easy or a two-week lockdown and then we can get back to life 
is really not what's going to happen. That, that whatever we do, we're potentially going to have to face for a year or two. Talking to Adam, I get a very strong sense that anyone who believes we can do a quick two-week lockdown and the virus will go away, they're wrong and they're underestimating the problem. We are in this for the long haul. It's going to be very tough, probably for everyone and for some people more than others. And we're all going to be involved in making it work. I'm quite good at like, lazing about and not doing very much with, with, um, with myself. I'm quite good at being a bit of a slob. There is a certain uh, serenity to surrendering, surrendering yourself. We've got board games, we've got Pictionary, we've got uh, some building blocks for my son. We were just watching reruns of Peppa Pig a lot and just eating everything in the house. I probably spent more time on the phone and on FaceTime to family than I have done in years. And also, I changed my bed's clothes and cleaned my flat, you know, to just sort of clear the decks. Just trying not to climb the walls, really. <laughs> For many of us, the prospect of being stuck at home and not being able to exercise is a stressful idea, but it is possible to keep fit at home and fitness instructor Sammy has kindly offered to share some tips with me. Thank you for coming over. Almost everyone in the country is going to be isolated yeah. at some point, pretty much stuck at home. Mm -hmm. So everyone is going to need to keep their spirits up and their fitness up. Yeah. Talk me through some simple things about what to do. OK, I think it's just about finding things you enjoy to do to start with. And it doesn't have to be high energy. It can be yoga, pilates. A really simple way is, as, as a hit timing, would be pick five exercises you enjoy and do 40 seconds of work with 20 seconds of rest. For you, we'd maybe a normal squat would just look like this, all right? So down and up. Beautiful, look at that. Oh, so you good. do know I'm what you're doing. Good already. And that could even turn into a squat jump. It's a real plyo movement there, okay. all right? Watch your head. So maybe that would be you, that squat jumps. Beautiful, just like that. Yay, look at that. Beautiful. This is what I was dreading you were going to make me do. And actually, <laughs> I've been and sitting. Actually, he's loving it. Well, you know what? This actually would be something my parents could do as well. For sure. That could literally be for an older person, you know, standing up and down ten times. So releasing the feet, squeeze out at the top, nice and steady pace. So you could do that for 40 seconds. Nice. Seven. Oh, you're getting quicker. Six. <laughs> Five. I want to see those knees all the way to the chest. Tap it, tap it, tap it. Yes. Go on. How much longer can you hold that? Go, go, go. Yes, yes. Use those arms. For the older generation, what I'd suggest, you could do, like, some knees to chest and just squeeze and hold. So they could literally hold on, support, bring that knee to chest, squeeze, and just release. Yeah. And you can so do nice. that while you're chatting to someone, right? That's yeah, not... for sure. That's yeah. not... I mean, I'm lazy and I don't mind doing this. <laughs> Tap, 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 drive it, drive Don't it. Don't have the pace on this Good. thing you do. Nice. So that's a half burpee. Oh, what? Yeah. What? That's a half one. A full burpee, you drop the whole chest to the floor and what? release the hands and then jump up. One, two, three. Yes, nice. Four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Ooh. Breathe. <sighs> Look, Sammy, you're brilliant. I really feel good. And what I love about this is it's something that I can do, my dad can do, yep. and someone who's super fit like you can do. We could all manage to do this every day. Yep. I love it. Just setting those goals and getting it done. You're wonderful. Thank I'd you. give you a hug, but I'm too sweaty and I know, coronavirus. We're not allowed. So, <laughs> all right, lovely. So figuring out how long we should self-isolate for isn't as complicated as it seems. If you live alone, like I do, then if I get symptoms, I have to self-isolate for seven days from the first day of symptoms. Now, if you live with other people, it's a bit different. So in order to explain it, I have borrowed this family from a friend of mine. Now, I wasn't able to borrow a doll's house, so instead, I'm going to use a cardboard box. So this family live in this house. Let me sketch out what it looks like here. There they are in the living room. And these are two bedrooms here. At the moment, they're all in the living room. Let's imagine that on the first day of the month, this member of the household gets symptoms, a cough, a fever. Now, they have to self-isolate from everyone else in the household if they can, but everyone in the household is now self-isolating for 14 days. They can't leave the house, even if someone else develops symptoms in the first seven days. So if you're seven days in and you develop symptoms, this person now has to self-isolate. I'm going to put them in the other bedroom 
This is difficult to manage for a lot of families, but let's say they're having a good go at it. There are two people self-isolated, and these people have to self-isolate for the full 14 days. Now, the only thing that's complicated is that after seven days, if someone else develops symptoms, suppose this person develops symptoms on day 13, then they have to self-isolate for a further seven days, but no one else in the household does. If you're feeling poorly, it's very hard to remember how long you've been feeling poorly for, so get a calendar or draw a calendar, put post-it notes on the fridge, anything you want to do, but keep track of these days because you don't want to be self-isolating any longer than you need to be. I can't imagine trying to self-isolate when there's other people in the house. That would just be a nightmare. It would be so difficult to stay in one room. If I'm in a room for a while, I'll just spray down the surfaces that I've been around and I'll cough into a tissue and then I'll been there and I'll sanitise my hands. My housemate has been doing everything for me in terms of, like, cooking and, and, you know, I've not been super hungry, but they've cooked meals for me and gone and bought different supplies and stuff. They've been really nice. So I'm on my way to see Jenny Harries, the Deputy Chief Medical Officer. And she is someone that I've been watching on the TV all week. And I, I feel somewhat reassured by some of those conferences, but also I have felt like everyone else, a certain amount of frustration, like why don't they have all the answers? Why do the guidelines keep changing? Why can't they tell us what to do and what's gonna happen? And um, speaking to the scientists I've spoken to this week, I think the sense I have is they are doing their best. They're guided by the data. Things will change as the data change. So. I really want to get some clarity from her about the government strategy, about how it's emerging, and what we can all do going forwards, particularly around self-isolation, to try and slow this down. I would imagine this is a very strange situation for you to be in, because this is a disease we haven't faced before, and it's not really like any other disease we've faced before. Is that approximately right? We haven't had a new disease like this in recent time, which is likely to affect a whole population where we have very little that we can offer, apart from good clinical care, the best thing we can offer are these interventions, public health interventions, to prevent disease spreading and protect those most at risk. There are people who've been very anxious, and I feel like at least on my social media, and I think a lot on the news, there have been even prominent scientists and some of them prominent doctors saying, um, we're not doing enough, we're behind Italy, we're not doing as good a job as Korea. And I think that's creating quite a lot of anxiety in, the, in many people's minds about whether or not the government is, is taking the right approach. Can you, can you talk about the strategy? It's very difficult to get across to the broader public, particularly at a time of anxiety with, this, with the new disease, quite how much work there is sitting behind this. So for the last 10, 15 years almost, we've had pandemic flu preparedness right across the country. That's not just on the medical side, it's about, you know, if a large number of people are unwell, what happens in local communities, if we need army support or there's unrest, all sorts of things. That is practice. We exercise routinely to manage these sorts of things. We're looking at every intervention, so all of the things that you've seen put in place internationally, we have looked at to see what the effect would be in our own population, and we have prioritised those and looked at when they would be most effective at which point in our epidemic curve. Um, and what you will have seen recently is we've highlighted the ones that are really important, so this self-isolation and family isolation if you have symptoms, and then tucking yourselves away and reducing your social interactions, social distancing uh, for other groups, and then increasingly we're adding in bits if they will add just that little bit of additional benefit. So school closures, for example, adds a small benefit because it reduces our overall social contact. I mean, we've seen in China there have been doors to apartment blocks welded shut. Italy's on full lockdown. Should we be doing that? So, uh, I mean, Italy, as an example, was a country which stopped flights coming in, of course, is actually probably the most affected country in Europe now. So there's not always a logical outcome to the things which people think are the things that we should do. And I would just challenge back by what we mean by lockdown. Uh, what we have done here, as we said, is have a plan. We've looked at every intervention that you could possibly do, including shutting borders and doing various other things. 
they all add a very small amount, potentially, but we have to have a balance between keeping people safely in their homes as well as shutting down. If we put too tight a restriction on, we may well find that the elderly lady who's your patient with a significant disease, if it's not carefully timed and planned, it will have no effect on the, uh, our epidemic curve, but it could cause significant distress to the, that individual uh, and even her other health conditions. Having talked to Jenny Harries, I have a very clear sense of how central self-isolation is to the government's strategy, both for the vulnerable and for people with symptoms. That is the main way that we slow down the spread of this virus. I guess I also felt quite reassured at the end of it. I've seen people panicking and not coping and saying, no, no, we've got a plan, especially in epidemics. And actually you think, do you have a plan? I don't think you're coping. And I had no sense of that from her. It felt to me like the government is being led by the science and that the science is pretty good. Maybe it's not perfect, it's a new disease, but that by doing the things we're being told to do, we will slow this epidemic down.